Hello, I'm Solomon Burnett, and today we are shooting an episode of Melon Intelligence. Um, we are writing exact good governance for black people in the Western Hemisphere. Today we have an interview with specialist Maurice Hines, who is going to talk about ancient mystery schools, literacy, things of that nature. Fabulous. And if that sounds interesting to you, um, come back after the break. Be sure to hit the subscribe button. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. And um, thank you for your time and indulgence, y'all. Peace. Hey, so we're back. This is Melon Intelligence. I'm Solomon Burnett. We're here with um, Specialist Maurice Hines. We're talking about uh, mystery schools, things of that nature, literacy. Um, bro. For a, would you mind just um, telling people who you are, where you're from, where you studied, <laughs> and yeah, what's, what, what's, what's, what's your pedigree? What's your genealogy of intelligence? Uh, well, Maurice Hines, um, where am I from? From a lot of places. Originally from Los Angeles, but I grew up here in Durham, uh, Durham, North Carolina. It's home. Back here on vacation from Cairo, where I'm living at right now. Been living there for about three years, learning a lot. Uh, in terms of my education, hmm. <laughs> so, you want my official education? Should I start there? Yes, please. Um, well, I went to public schools here in the U.S. That's probably the, the worst <laughs> part of my education. And then, uh, but I, I did go to Durham School of the Arts. Graduated from there and uh, then uh, went to UNC for undergrad. I majored in uh, communications, film production. <laughs> um, and then um, from there, Sudan. Um, I studied uh, how to teach Arabic to non native speakers. I was teaching for a little while, then I transitioned into library and information science. One of the best uh, decisions of my life, I think. And then uh, now, right now, I'm um, in another master's program at American University, where I also work uh, in Arabic and Islamic civilizations. Word. Um, so, give us uh, an explanation of your current mode of interest, what you're interested <laughs> in, and um, how you interested, why you're interested in it. Mm, interesting. Okay. So, uh, we start talking about the, the ancient mystery schools. Um, this is kind of what got me, you know, thinking and studying Islam a little bit more. I was introduced to it as a, as a young person, kind of studying Afrocentric stuff. And, uh, you know, you, you come across works that talk about the ancient Egyptian mystery schools and stuff like that. Um, there's a, a pivotal book that I came across um, called uh, Stolen Legacy. Uh, Greek philosophy is stolen Egyptian philosophy. And uh, I think that's one of the pivotal works in Afrocentric thought. Uh, but I, I, I would hope that Afrocentric people would pay more attention to it uh, because in the book, although the author, George D.M. James, doesn't mention uh, Islam by name, he basically says that um, the Moors and the Arabs were the ones that continued um, the teachings of the ancient mystery schools and uh, you know, brought it back to Europe. Um, so, you know, there, there are a few passages in that book that kind of, you know, sparked my interest about Islam, so that's how I kind of uh, started studying Islam more seriously. If, um, hmm. So, um, could you tease that out? Um, what is a mystery school and how is it related to Islam? Okay, so, um, I guess my magnum opus that I hope to write someday before I die, inshallah, um, is going to be, uh, on Islamic education and the revival of, of ancient mystery schools. So the ancient mystery schools, um, from what I gather from, uh, you know, my readings of Masonic sources and and history, 
is that these were just the ancient religion of the world um, prior to the, um, I guess, the naming of religions in different locales, different locations around the world. Um, it was originally an, a monotheistic faith and it was very developed. They had a holistic way of viewing education. Um, they, 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 they did the metaphysical and the, the physical um, was all part of one educational system. Um, but not just anyone could be part of this educational system. Um, there were people who weren't part of it and they didn't really understand all the symbols that were, um, that all the symbols and rituals and things like that that were um, that were made up in the, that were uh, part of the, the mystery schools. And then there is uh, also people who joined the mystery schools uh, in terms of in initiation, which uh, uh, Rene Gonon uh, unpacked it for us to say that it's a commitment to a traditional uh, um, school of the uh, spirituality and theology which we know know as religion today um, and um, it, it, this commitment involved either the the lesser mysteries or the greater mysteries the greater mysteries were those who uh, trained to be high priests and um, rulers in the society um, no one can no one could become a ruler or you know, an advisor to a ruler or a priest or something like that in these ancient societies without going through this rigorous educational system, the greater mysteries. Um, and then the lesser mysteries were those that had the commitment, but they didn't go through the rigorous, uh, you know, process of initiation that a scholarly or a priestly class went through. Hmm. So... How are the mystery schools as understood as, I guess, the spiritual authority and political power of ancient societies? How is this related to Islam? Uh -huh. <laughs> so, there, there's a historical relation that I'm still you know sort of piecing the puzzles together for but there's also um, there's also um, you, you see a lot of parallels between Islamic education the traditional Islamic education and the ancient mystery schools where you just sort of tease them apart I'm still working on you know a lot of these uh, what a lot of these uh, theories but um, I would say the the process of um, of transmission of information. Um, so in the ancient mystery schools, uh, the process the process of transmission was oral. You had to have a teacher. Um, I don't know of any other um, uh, system of spirituality nowadays that really puts an emphasis on that. Uh, maybe Hinduism does, but uh, uh, we can discuss that later. Um, um, they, they, Islam places an emphasis on uh, what we call senate, the chain of transmission. And this, tra this chain of transmission should go back to uh, a higher authority, um, a prophet, uh, which is the person that really ushers, ushers in a new era in time. So um, uh, the historical relationship between uh, the ancient mysteries and Islam, um, I mean, there's a lot of things that we have to unpackage because we don't really, uh, we don't really, un we don't really uh, study this aspect of history in, in the West, at least not in America. I don't know what your world history, uh, <laughs> your <laughs> tenth grade world history class was like, but uh, we didn't really study much of um, 
of history of the, in the Middle East, North Africa. Um, so you kind of have to unpackage a lot of that. Um, I would say that that um, you know this period between um, you know after the death of, of Christ and um, the coming of the the Prophet Muhammad uh, is an interesting period in time that uh, is um, is not. We, we really kind of need to unpackage a lot of that history. So, um, if you read stuff about the ancient mystery schools and Masonic texts, you know, they talk about um, the mystery schools sort of becoming, going in, in decline, uh, particularly prior to this era, because, you know, the people who became priests and leaders, they became corrupted. And um, and um, there is a, a major decline in, in the quality of the ancient mystery schools. So there became a lot of infighting, uh, a lot of doctrinal differences, and um, people sort of rallied in their own camps. And this is kind of where we start to get uh, religions from. Um, and then with the fighting and the warring that was going on during the, this period, you had uh, the breaking of, of, of chains of uh, transmission. Um, so um, you can only reestablish those chains with a spiritual authority, like a prophet. And so that's why you have, you know, in the Bible, in the Quran, you know, is a mentioning of a series of prophets that were uh, sent to really sort of like redirect people back to the original path. Um, and so um, Christ came, um, Muslims call uh, Isa alayhi salam. Um, he came and he reinstituted what we would say the ancient mystery schools or the original religion of mankind. Um, but people differed. People differed on um, his nature and the nature of God. So there's all these questions that um, popped up in this this um, area of the world that we talk about: um, North Africa, Mesopotamia, um, ancient India. Um, and uh, the Arabian Peninsula. Um, so, usually, people that talk about the um, the the biography of the Prophet Muhammad, they usually start off discussing uh, the three superpowers in the world at that time: uh, Rome, uh, whose location was in present-day Turkey. Um, not current day Rome, um, Persia, the Persian Empire, and the Ethiopian Empire. And uh, they were kind of in conflict with each other. They, uh, they, they, they kind of fought these proxy wars via the Arabian Peninsula. Um, so the, the Arabs were strategic in that sense that, that they, could, they could fight off the Romans for on the cause of the, the Persians. Um, and vice versa, depending on how they manipulate the tribes. So, um, you know, the, during this period, there's a lot of, uh, of course, fighting, but there are also a lot of uh, spiritual ideas, uh, different religious ideas that were going around. And when we study, uh, you know, the biography of the Prophet, we study the history of Islam. In pre-Islamic Arabia, there was a lot of... Um, there are a lot of different, uh, um, it was pretty much kind of a no man's land, but also a wel welcoming place uh, for a lot of different ideas. Uh, so we know that's where the Kaaba was, uh, where, you know, there's a lot of um, um, what we call poly polytheistic faiths. But at the same time, there were, there were um, uh, Jewish clans 
living in this area. They were um, Christian clans who had varying beliefs about uh, Christianity, about the nature of Christ, um, probably not the, the Mycenaean version. Uh, and then also uh, you had other groups like Zoroastrians, um, who kind of came from Persia, Sabians, which were um, Ethiopian, uh, Yemenis, um, and you also had um, Hanifs, um, or the Hunafat, which um, is kind of like, they, they were considered the followers of Abraham, but they, they kind of lost all of their, um, their transmission and they preserved only a few practices of, of that original uh, faith that they had. And, um, you know, their, what we know of their rituals, that they venerated the Kaaba, much like the, the polytheistic, uh, polytheistic Arabs at the time. Um, but they also were monotheists and they didn't believe, they didn't uh, worship uh, multiple uh, deities. At the same time, they, they worshiped at night, uh, which is a uh, very interesting. If you want to talk about the ancient mystery schools, uh, the ancient mystery schools, they, they did their worship and rituals, uh, mainly at night. Um, but other than that, we don't really know too much about them. Um, but most uh, biographers of the, of the prophet you know, they say that he came from a lineage of Hanifs. Uh, <laughs> so, um, where should I go from there? <laughs> oh, I mean, shoot, that's, um, that's, 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 the, so the relationship of the mystery schools to Islam, I thank you for, you know, bringing it through the different empires and also um, bringing it up to the prophet through the um, family of the prophet. Um, could one say in biblical language that the Hanif, the Hunafat, were um, the Ishmaelites of Abraham's descendants? Uh, we could say that, yeah. Sorry, I left that out. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I'm just, you know, I'm realizing, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to the explanation and I appreciate the length and breadth of it. Yeah. Um, you know. Um, you can fill in the gaps. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. we just, had these conversations before. <laughs> and so I just, I just wanted to, you know, mention, you know, that, um, that in addition to, you know, what we understand is Judaism. There are descendants of Abraham who kept up his religion. You know, these are the Midianites, Jethro, who um, Moses lived with. Moses married his daughter, mm -hmm. Kedar, the tents of Kedar, mentioned in the Song of Solomon, yeah. which is, you know, the um, ancestor of Muhammad. And so yeah. I just... Yeah, that's an important point that uh, the peoples of these ancient places, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, Egypt... Uh, Persia, Rome, you know, they're all like pretty much like the same people. Um, you know, they, they've had these ancient interactions with each other for millennia. Um, so they're very much familiar with each other's, um, um, you know, spiritual thought, you know, what's going on politically, what have you. So, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, overlap, cultural overlap, linguistic overlap. Um, um, yeah, so, you know, they're, they're, they're the same people. So, you know, there's, there, when we study history of the study, study the history of these places, we have to keep in mind that, um, you know, all these histories are connected. It's not just the, the, the history of Egypt and, and you can isolate Egypt from Arabian Peninsula, from Rome and what have you. Um. You have to study all these things holistically. Um, so, so often, you know, I guess when we're growing up here in the United States, particularly if you have a, a Afrocentric background, then you know people are, um, you know, we we venerate ancient Egypt, and you know we want to say that you know this is part of our our heritage, but 
you, you really can't talk about this history without talking about the history of the of the, the greater region. So, you know, after um, after the rise of the, the, the Prophet Muhammad and, ha and he solidified Islam for the Arabians in the Arabian Peninsula, um, after his death, you know, shortly after, or actually while he was alive and then shortly after his death, then, you know, there's these, um, um, these uh, um, military missions from the followers of the Prophet Muhammad uh, to go into different lands uh, and open them up for Islam. So in, in Arabic, you know, when they talk about the, these, they call them futuhat, um, um, which are openings. Um, um, and, and they have a particular way of uh, thinking about this. They're, they're saying that they're not necessarily out to spread Islam, but they're opening up, opening it up for um, the Islamic era, basically. Um, so I guess I have a blog <laughs> when, when I, you know, I discuss some of these things called the Archives. If you want to, um, you know, quickly Google it and uh, look up my thoughts in a more organized fashion. One of the things, one of the um, terms that I deal with is uh, Ummah. Um, you know, usually Muslims translate this as the, the, the global Muslim community. Um, but, or the Muslim nation, or however they want to translate it. But um, one of the many meanings of the word Ummah, or the many usages of the word Ummah, is um, a, an epoch. So every prophet, they came with an Ummah, or they, 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 had, they established an Ummah, a nation, and... Um, and this can be temporal. It can it can be seen as temporal, um, not so not so much spatial. Um, so um, one of the one of the the, the 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 I guess concepts that I'm dealing with is the the fact that um, you know when Islam spread, uh, they were opening up this new epoch in time, this new ummah, uh, as we can call it, the, the, the ummah of Muhammad. Um, and along with a new epoch, there, there are new knowledges um, that are introduced to the world. There's a return to, um, to the original way of, of, of moral and uh, spiritual thought, but there's also new knowledges that, that are opening open open up to the world. So that's why, you know, after the advent of the Prophet Muhammad and the spread of Islam, you know, you had this new, like, renewed um, uh, intellectual movement. Um, and they divided their knowledges up into al-ulum al-naqliya and al-ulum al-aqliya. Um, al-ulum al-aqliya are considered to be the rational sciences. Um, these are um, what they call, you know, things that were inherited from previous uh, nations, like the Greeks, like the Indians, like the Chinese, and they develop upon these. And they figure that, you know, if you if you you can deduce these um, these knowledges um, just by rational thought, by experimentation. Um, but um, the Al-Ulum al the trans the transmitted sciences, these had to be kept, um, they had to be transmitted ideally orally, and um, you had to have the, you have to have the chain of transmission go all the way back to a prophet. So these are the linguistic sciences um, in the Arabic language. Um, these are histor historical sciences, uh, things like hadith, uh, of course the Quran, the holy te text, um, the pronunciation of it, as well as its um, 
its explanation. Uh, these sciences all had to be preserved through naql, through transmission, direct transmission from student to teacher, and so on. Um, um, yes. Just quickly, um, naql. Naql. Transmission. Transmission. Mm -hmm. Continue, please. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so they, they reestablished this, um, this uh, educational system. And, you know, likewise, there were debates um, that uh, came about that kind of are similar to the ancient mystery schools. So in the ancient mystery schools, you had um, the, 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 the priestly learned class. They were also intertwined with the ruling class. And so there are debates early on in Islamic history between uh, the nature of, you know, the caliphate. You had the divide between Sunni and Shia and how they looked at uh, leadership. Um, uh, some would say that, you know, the, the, the leader should be the, the temporal leader should also be the spiritual leader. Um, others said that you know, there's no the 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 temporal leader doesn't doesn't necessarily have to be an um, intellectual or, a, <laughs> or a necessarily spiritual person. Um, so of course that debate uh, exists to this day. Um, and just quickly, just yes, temporal means um, in time and space, temporary, temporal, like of this world mm -hmm. as opposed to spiritual so temporal leader like a polit political leader or a leader of men or a leader of a area versus a spiritual leader which would be like an ordained or anointed messiah or divine rightful ruler kingship of sorts mm -hmm. sorry I just wanted to say that for people who might not hear the word temporal Sorry. Regularly. No, <laughs> hey, bro, bro. Like, uh, I'm glad we can speak in. I'm glad we can we can speak in these terms. But you know, what I mean, um, we 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 speak in the share. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, so, so what else should I should I talk about? Oh well, bro. Um, wow, bro. You know the idea of an epoch. You know, not necessarily being you know, um, understood or known in the ways that people would necessarily consider it, you know, um, or, or, you know, and just thinking about genealogies and mystery schools, I guess the obvious question would be, um, so we said, um, what are mystery schools? How are mystery schools related to Islam? How are mystery schools related to Islam, related to Freemasonry? <laughs> okay, that's a, a big question too, yeah. Um, hmm, where should I start with that? In your, in, 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 in your in, humble opinion. In my humble opinion. My humble opinion, um, you know, I'm not against Freemasons. Um, but um, I, I think if you if you read their works, they kind of like uh, even like Afrocentric scholars, you know, they're they're um, committed to you know researching these ancient um, ancient traditions, trying to extract the wisdom from these ancient mystery schools as much as they can. Um, but at the end of the day, they're really trying to reconstruct it um, they're not they don't have a train a, 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 um, a genealogy as you say or a train of transmission that goes back to an um, to an authority and uh, I think if you read their books if you sort of talk to someone who's learned it uh, then they will they will admit to these 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 things um, but they are saying that they will re, re um, they would probably say that they re-established uh, the transmission. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. And what of the person who would say that the points of transmission, the points of knuckle that you reference, are in actuality 
not even real personalities, not even individual beings, but are solely, but are in actuality just representatives of this organization, of that organization. What would you be your response to which organization? Yeah. Let's let, let, let's say let's say let's say your critique is that um, that according to and, and I'm, I'm if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. um, according to. The science of genealogy of intelligence mm -hmm. transmission called nakul in Arabic. There are some things that need be known and transmitted by word of mouth, and they necessarily need be traced back to a personality who has brought forth a new age or epoch called a prophet. Mm -hmm. Your critique of Freemasonry's relationship to mystery schools is that it's acknowledged that the chain has been broken, but you don't think that the chain has been the chain, the knuckle of transmission has been legitimately reestablished. Well, I, I I I don't say it hasn't legitimately been reestablished, but um, I mean they 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 admit to reconstructing it. Okay. Um, and then they reestablish a, 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 a transmission system. Uh, I mean, <laughs> that's 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 kind of what what I'm saying. But maybe, maybe what what you're saying is like. Um, well, if if I may, mm -hmm. in some of my conversations, I've been people have told me that I'm understanding the points of transmission, the points of prophecy as individual personalities. When these individual personalities are, in actuality, titles given to representatives of the Freemasonic organization of that time. Uh. And fair, so there is no enough. Jesus. Jesus is mm -hmm. the front man for the lodge of that time. There is no Moses. Moses is the front man for the lodge of that time. There is no Melchizedek. Melchizedek is the front man of the ancient order of that time. Fair enough. But, um, I mean, that's these per personalities are all we have. Uh, well, I, you can. <laughs> I, I, I prefer, uh -huh. in, in this vein, I've started just calling them intelligences. Mm -hmm. And that way, you know, don't even lend myself to the confusion of the semantics of yeah. the... Yeah. yeah, I mean, we can we can say, like, I mean, did the Prophet Muhammad study Greek philosophy? No. <laughs> but his followers did. So he's in, reintroducing... I mean, but but he he gives a framework for them to, um, for for them to study other things. Um, he actually builds an intelligentsia or an acad or an aca aca academy, so to speak, um, much in the same way that we have you know an academy um, in our university systems, hmm. where you know you have your your way of looking at sources, your epistemology. Um, epistemology meaning history of ideas. Mm -hmm. Continue. Um, and, and, and what you claim to be an, um, uh, a credible source. Um, what, what I see nowadays, because I, you know, I work in, of course, at American University, um, but sort of part-time. Uh, you know, I'm, um, I study in study within and study uh, about um, the Islamic uh, educational system and um, the Islamic educational system um, you know they, they have their own sort of source material what they think what they deem to be uh, reliable sources based on their criteria um, which differs you know almost 100 percent from uh the american system that a lot of us uh, uh learn in it's not completely different actually but um because if you think about like why do we go to school uh versus you know just reading books to be qualified on the subject um 
you know, we still, to a certain degree, the, we, we value teachers, we value that direct transmission between, uh, from student to teacher. Um, so, you know, there, and of course there, there's, there's books that were written, I'm thinking um, uh, George Mectesey, uh, who wrote a, um, who wrote a book called um, you mentioned that and George Mectesey he, he, he writes about Islamic education um, I think it's a history of Muslim education but he makes the connection between um, the Muslim uh, or Islamic education and how it sort of fed into um, uh, European uh, educational system um and more than one author, of course, has made that connection. Um, but um, you know, when you, when you talk about the, the these these various traditions, religious traditions, you know, they they, they all have their source material. Um, they all have their um, their way of looking at um, knowledge. Um, so I guess that that kind of bring us to, to Rene Ganon, <laughs> which you're more of an expert on. I just oh, started, you know, uh, familiar, familiarizing myself with his, uh, with his work. That's the first time I'd heard your drum come out in this What's whole that? conversation. <laughs> familiarizing. <laughs> yeah, I'm familiarizing myself with that work, with his uh, body of work. But, you know, he, he's, you know, supposedly uh, attributed the the, the founder of um, traditionalism, you know, people using a traditional, um, engaging a traditional religious system, how would you say it? Um, he, he favors people going through a traditional uh, system rather than solely reading books <laughs> on the topic or uh, pseudo, pseudo uh, initiatic organizations that really sort of, you know, just try to research things and sort of, you know, take a little bit from Hindu, from the Jewish tradition, from Kabbalah, or from Islam, and try to mesh them all together in some sort of, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> oh man, which unfortunately is is pretty much what the you know, hodgepodge mysticisms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's become popular religion in in the in, in the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. and um, some people either go the route of uh, perennialism, you know, saying that all religions are the same, uh, or some people go the route of, um, you know, sort of I'm spiritual but not religious. Not not to say that because uh, I used to be one of those people, even as a Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know I, I've you know sort of seen some of the follies in that because you know when you if, if you're if you're serious about learning something you want to learn it the, the right way and you want to learn it from the source so if you're um, it's like mix, mixed martial arts I think that's probably a better ana analogy Indeed. Like if you're doing mixed martial, martial arts then um you know the. You you don't want to go, and just study something called mixed martial arts, where you don't know where the, the 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 origins of these various moves. You want to, you want to learn the system, from people that have mastered that those different systems, and then you want to be able to bring it together. Uh, if you just get a hodgepodge of, moves, you know here and there, you'll easily be torn apart by a master of, of, of that martial art um, whereas if you know each martial art from its source then no matter what move someone brings to you you can you can engage them in their language so to speak uh, I'm also a student of Steve Muhammad who <laughs> he talks about uh, um, martial arts as a, as, as a language Whoa, now that's heavy, that's heavy, heavy, heavy. Man, maybe that's someone you need to get on the show. Well, yeah, a, a, um, I just watched his, um, his, his demonstration on, um, on, um, on, on, on 
Facebook, one of his like things with mm-hmm. like the minister in the crowd, and you know, he just has his students up there, and he was just showing them like all, you know, it's it's, bro, even his, um, even his like spectacular display, like this is what I'm gonna do for the people. Mm-hmm. It's like a cute technique, mm-hmm. you know, like nuanced joint manipulation that just brings about these beautiful flourishes of geese. It's like he's making flowers around himself and stuff. It's, um, it's, it's, he, he, he's, he's, I don't, I don't he, he, he emphasizes practice and technique. Oh, yeah. Um, Practical stuff and technique. Yeah. Fighting. Um, pra- <laughs> um, as language, phraseology of motion being how people talk about choreography and dance, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? But I've, um, and um, Cairo, Rico, um, mm-hmm. uh, he talks about, um, he says every boxing match should be understood as a conversation between two parties, mm-hmm. and um, boxing should not be understood as violence, but as engagement. Mm-hmm. Um, so, interestingly enough, you know, I, I think there's a video where, um, where Steve Muhammad, he's talking about, uh, you know, conflict and fighting. There's the highest form of communication is, you know, using your, your you know, using your words mm-hmm. to defuse a situation or to combat somebody. He said the lowest form is, is actual physical fighting. Um, and sort of tying this back into uh, it's a education and all this it's stuff. <laughs> this is a grand mystery, sir. You know, I'm also a librarian and... Um, <laughs> also, a, also a librarian. Yeah, so, so the, uh, the uh, threshold concepts of librarianship, uh, which is, is is not about librarianship, it's about scholarship, uh, higher learning. Um, they say the one of the one of these threshold co- uh, concepts is that scholarship is a conversation. So the way that people converse. Is through scholarly works, um, you know, well researched scholarly works, not just, you know, me getting on YouTube and sharing my opinion or even my blog or whatever. You know, this is, you know, you want to, you want well, well researched. I mean, blogs can be part of the scholarship, scholarly conversation, but as long as it's informative <laughs> <laughs> and informed, right? Um, well, yeah. Um, the, the Islamic educational system is really an ideal form of this, uh, this, this scholarly conversations. I mean, I, I um, so bringing it back to literacy, uh, I guess why I wanted to talk about literacy because I, I have this book that I'm working on called um, uh, Towards, Islam, Towards Islamic Literacy. Um, so I'm using these concepts in librarianship concept of information literacy and applying it to Islamic studies and you see there's a lot of overlap in uh, in traditional Islamic studies you know no one um, person at least in the Sunni tradition really has authority um, to, to say you know this is what the Quran means or this is what a particular verse or hadith means it's a body of scholars that come to a uh, to a um, consensus, a consensus, a on a particular subject, um, and this consensus can be made. You know, it's not made in one sitting. Uh, it's made over time. Of course, it's it's a hot topic. You know, within Islamic <laughs> studies, you know, is there even such thing as a consensus? <laughs> but but I think our Nicene Creed. Yeah, but, 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 when, so, but when you really you know. Come to study these things, of course, every scholar, every real scholar, they would end their work with uh, Allahu A'lam. Allah knows best. Uh, so there's a degree of academic humility there. Um, and also, you know, there's a range. There's, there's an acceptable range of difference. There's an unacceptable range of difference, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I've, um, you know, sitting with one of the, the teachers at, um, at Al-Azhar, 
you know, we talked about this concept of the Ummah, right? You know, within the Ummah, you have, uh, you have um, the Ummah, the greater Ummah, um, which encompasses this whole time and, and that we're in, this epoch that we're in. Um, but then you also have the Muslim Ummah, people that ascribe to some version of Islam. And then with Within there, you have uh, people that are considered uh, Ahlul Qibla, um, um, and then you have like Ahlul Sunnah. And well, you have Ahlul means people. Ahlul Qibla Bayt. means direction of prayer. Sunnah means the way of the Prophet. Would you mind just yeah, yeah. giving a trip? Oh, yeah. You said Ahlul yeah. Qibla, Ahlul yeah. Sunnah, Ahlul Bayt. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm packing the terms. Um, yeah, so. Um, Ahl Qibla are, are, are people that face the Qibla in their prayer. Uh, and this encompasses every type of Muslim that turns to the Qibla, turns to the Kaaba in Mecca for prayer. Um, and then Ahl um, Sunnah, um, it's an abbreviation for Ahl Sunnah wal Jamaah, the people of. Um, the way of the prophet and um, in the mm. community, the yeah. smaller community, the cons the consensual com community. I don't know if that the, the the community of consensus. <laughs> Sorry. And um, and then there's a ahl bait, meaning referring to the ahl bait of the prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, so you know, people of the house, people of the the house, literally, um, household, the household, or the 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 people that that follow the the household of the prophet, so on. And of course, you know, these terms have been kind of uh, politicized and solidified. You know, if, if you if you talk, I mean, nowadays we we, we abbreviate all these things, right? We we, we say uh, Sunni instead of Ahl Sunnah wal Jamaa. Um, and then we say um, Shia, or Shia to Ali, Shia to Ali, um, the the followers of Ali, or the followers of Ahl Bayt. Um, there's overlap, of course, because mm. yeah. the the people that call themselves Shia, they also, you know, follow the Sunnah of the Prophet. They have their own Jama'ah or Ijma on certain things, right? And uh, likewise, there, there are people who would consider themselves Ahlul Sunnah that also ascribe to the Ahlul Bayt. Many of the Ahlul Bayt are also, also consider themselves Ahlul Sunnah. So, you know, um, you know, yeah. all of these terms have to be yeah. defined. And, 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 and defined in their proper context, yeah. deconstructed and reconstructed in their proper context. Yeah. Um, to deconstruct without reconstruction and one's proper reconstruction in the proper context is just destructive. Yeah. <laughs> regardless of how smart we are. Um, yeah. I probably I, got where, where I was even going with that. Well, I wanted to ask, um, all right, so, you know, this podcast is called Melon Intelligence, a.k.a. Intelligence. Mm -hmm. I feel like intelligence as we know it today is knowledge and science is knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that's been truncated by white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And so intelligence is, you know, intelligence with the necessary piece that's been truncated, put back in place, and given a holistic perspective of sorts. And so with regards to Islam, the study of mystery schools, mm -hmm. um, its impact on epistemologies, um, what can... What can our understanding of mystery schools today do to help help with to to help us deconstruct white supremacy? Not even reconstruct it in its proper context. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's a very good question. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know, just just recently, you know, I kind of, you know, started um, studying a little bit about uh, the Moorish Science Temple, uh, 
which doesn't come from the the uh, the traditionalist perspective. It comes from more sort of neo spiritualist uh, trajectory. Trajectory. Um, well, yeah, sorry. I, if mm-hmm. I may, I just want to say um, with regards to more science, um, nation of Islam, mm-hmm. even aspects of Garveyism, I've begun calling those neo Islamic. Neo Islamic. You know, just to give them um, their due separate engagement as opposed to say Blavatskyism mm-hmm. or you know what I mean because they're yeah. part of a matrix of mystical works that are being written in English of a particular time yeah and so you know when we talk about you know say the more science temple we can say neo-spiritualist mm-hmm. which puts it actually in the matrix that it's supposed to but the very unique thing about these yeah. things is that in a certain way they actually point towards a legitimate a legitimate chain yeah. Always pointing to people towards Mecca. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting that um, uh, African Americans, blacks, Moors, whatever you want to call us, uh, we, we gravitated to Islam. Um, maybe, you know, some of those our, our, our enslaved ancestors made some really powerful prayers you know, for us to, you know, come back, um, to this tradition, but, um, you know, I, I think it's interesting, you know, each one of these, these groups, they, they made Islam accessible to African Americans, people that live in this land that might have been descendants of slaves, or might have been the descendants of free black people in the, in these lands, um, particularly the the more science temple, and their how they 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 started really not talking about race, and saying that race. Um, if you if you constantly see yourself as a black person within America or an African American or something like that, then you are really buying into the race the racist system um whereas if you start talking about nationality um then you have a more um level playing field and you start dealing with treaties and negotiations between nations and i I found it interesting um kind kind of going back to um you know this question that that uh I didn't ask on camera, but you know, I asked it before we got into the car coming here. Um, why is it that people of Iraq, the Levant, and North Africa, after they embraced Islam, why did they become Arabs? Whereas other people that embraced Islam, like the Persians, the Turks, um, the Indonesians, Sub Saharan Africans, Africans yeah. they didn't become they didn't become Arabs when they embraced Islam. And, uh, of course, we, we, we kind of chatted about this. And then, coming back to the Coptics, of, mm-hmm. of the Coptic community, of the Coptic Christians of uh, Egypt, um, I once heard it said that they have Arab citizenship. Um, and so... What Mo- Noble Drew Ali and some of his uh, followers kind of expanded upon, they 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 brought back into this, they brought us into this conversation of citizenship, and um, and that's how some Muslim slaves won their freedom. Uh, interestingly enough, like uh, Abdurrahman ibn Suri, um, based on these treaties that America had with the Moroccan government. And then um, so somehow he tapped into you know this uh, the, the 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 Moorish idea, the Berber Amazigh idea of that they were these ancient peoples from Arabia, like these these meta histories that um, he kind of started tapping into these meta histories that existed on the continent of Africa. Um, and you know the Hebrew Israelites they started taking on some of these these 
these um these meta histories as well like there are certain Nigerian tribes and Fulani tribes that 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 think of themselves as ancient Hebrews mm -hmm. um so it's interesting that we we started to tap into this tradition uh where we see ourselves not simply as black people or African people in America, but we're tapping into actual nationalities, um, ancient peoples that that um, the world respects. So, um, you know, I think figuring this out, figuring this out, you know, the, the, the ancient mystery schools will help us really um, figure out our place in, um, in this society and how we can better negoti negotiate uh, our terms of existing here. Um, of course, this is an ongoing struggle and um, I'm not really sure where it's at in terms of our intelligentsia. Are, are, are there... Says the librarian from Cairo. <laughs> <laughs> are, there, are there people... Are there people who are really like, you know, studying, um, um, you know, these these treaties? As far as I know, I think maybe some of the Moors are are doing this, but I'm not really seeing the. Um, maybe maybe they can make this documentation a little bit more available to the average um, well, Moor living in uh, America. Yeah. Well, for, to, to more of us, if, if, mm -hmm. if they would. Um, I think, wow, bro, that's, that, that's heavy, bro. And so just you, you, basically if one buys into the notions of race that are projected on blacks in the Western Hemisphere, then you're automatically inserting yourself in a hierarchy in which you were seen as inferior. Yeah. But if one deals in a notion of nationality, then one is in an inner nation, international mindset in which one's space of inferiority or, or superiority is negotiated in terms of conversation and treaty. Yeah. And, and I think this is the Islamic tradition. So, you know, I talk about, you know, the, the Moorish Science Temple, but we can say, you know, of course, the, the nation mm -hmm. of Islam, you know, again, uh, going back to this idea of nation, nationhood, um, they continued this conversation. Oh, that's deep, bro. I and, never even thought about that, bro. What's and, your nation, nationality? <laughs> Islam. Mm -hmm. And then Malcolm X, who, you know, um, played a very pivotal role in this really uh making it more tangible to out, outside of the 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 sort of like you know the the, the muslim currents at that time right i mean he, you know at, towards the end of his life you know he was talking about going to the united nations united nations and uh having black people negroes in america however you want to call it you know represented there and breathe bring grievances uh even you know that's what they say god don't smoke that's what they that's what some people i'm, I'm of the opinion that it's another thing that yeah. he was shot for Me but too. that's some that's what some people say he was shot for yeah yeah but i mean it's probably all part of one well, thing right <laughs> i think that i think that national consciousness you know and, and when you talk about being understood as a nation i think that we often um we often don't, or we often understand, any nation state understands that it has come into power by virtue of a revolutionary sacrifice on the part of its forefathers. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, Brazilians know about their decolonial wars, um, Kenyans know about the Mau Mau, and African Americans, African Americans don't know about black Civil War soldiers. Mm -hmm. We think that our national consciousness comes from the victimization of the 1960s, not the freedom fighting 
of the 1860s on the part of African Americans. Mm. So whereas everyone else in the world's national consciousness mm. is leaked to violent sacrifice, our national consciousness in this space is abstracted, distracted mm. from our point of violent sacrifice. And I was saying in addition to that. To the point of and the thing is, you know, it was a real nationalist sacrifice because after our sacrifice, we then had the Northern Army occupy the South in order to protect our communities, just like any other refugee nation that had, in, that had engaged in a victorious revolution would have. Mm -hmm. I would say in addition to that, too, once you have the, 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 the initial violent takeaway, uh, which, you know, France Fanon, you know, eloquently talks about how do you sustain it <clears throat> through treaties and this is you know how I mean the, the precedent was set with um, you know a lot of the Native American tribes mm -hmm. who also fought against the American government <laughs> and and even though I guess we could say they didn't necessarily win but they the treaties. but they were in a position to negotiate, mm -hmm. and uh, of course they got the, the bad end of the stick. But you know, <laughs> you know they were at least um, able to negotiate, um, and this is what you know the Moors pull from. You know the, these treaties with the uh, Native American treaties. Indeed. And um, so you know, Malcolm X, um, you know he 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 wanted to. Th stop talking about civil rights bring this into the realm of human rights um, and I think I think Malcolm X was such a critical point in this and he, he popularized some of these ideas for the non-Muslim African American community but after his demise who really Sort of hung on to those to those ideals. Um, we can say, I mean, we can speculate. Yeah, well, I think that um, I think that when we talk when we're talking about national consciousness, international consciousness, I think that one thing that's a product of a national consciousness is a strategic planning and grand design. Mm -hmm. And I think that African Americans coming out of slavery, coming up from slavery during Reconstruction, um, specifically in certain ways, lacked strategic planning and grand design. How could they have it? They up from slavery, they fresh in Reconstruction, and the bubble that was built for them in order to develop these faculties, which is Reconstruction and Northern Occupation, was punctured, perforated in so many different ways by the hidden hands of the KKK, which was the collusion of the Northern Occupying Army and the Southern Gentry. Mm -hmm. um, I think that Malcolm X, in his travel, became aware that, like, the Nation of Islam was teaching that plans had been made for African Americans hundreds of years before they even had the consciousness to even know how to counteract them. And that plan intergenerational plans, strategic designs, grand strategic plans and grand designs have been put in play. Mm -hmm. And the only way to really get people to um, think on this level was a certain type of internationalization, a certain type of study, a mm -hmm. particular type of travel, mm -hmm. a particular type of Islam. Yeah. And, and, and I think that um, and I just want to say what the project of melon intelligence of intelligence is to start bringing strategic planning and grand design to contemporary issues mm -hmm. African Americans are forced to have a very short political memory mm -hmm. which makes us you know manipulable by grander powers based on what we can do for the moment to assuage our immediate needs mm -hmm. we need to start thinking 50 years ahead yeah. 100 years ahead yeah. thinking about outside sources of funding mm -hmm. which necessitates travel yes so, and not, not just that, because I, I think a, a critical part of this, uh, to do strategic planning, 
you have to have an intelligentsia. You have to have an academy that can preserve the the, mm-hmm. the uh, intellectual history yeah. of your of your people, right? And I don't think it's gonna it's gonna come through the colleges and universities as we know them today. Um, where I see Islam as being very strategic in this is that they already have an academy and there are also black versions of this academy that you can easily plug, plug I'm going to say easily but you can plug into access relative, yeah. um, so these um, this is this kind of manifests itself with, would you give an example quickly yeah it manifests itself in the way of people going overseas to study and um and um and really capture various sciences of the of the Islamic tradition. Because is Islam is on the you know, it's an ideology. Uh I probably hate to use that that term because that's what a lot of right wing people mm-hmm. use. But it is an ide- ideology on the level of communism, on the level of socialism, on the level of capitalism, that you can you can structure a whole nation around. Mm-hmm. So you know it deals with economics, it deals with healthcare, it deals with um, you know various aspects of human existence. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not just you know religious, <laughs> you know, so, so civil society. Yeah. So the more that we plug into that system and of course we have to modernize the language a little bit and you know keep these intellectual conversations going bring it to America um, but then once we, we, we plug into that then we have a, a, a system you don't have to recreate you don't have to recreate any knowledge <laughs> necessarily yeah we, we have it plugged into a source uh, you know, um, and we yeah. also get and we also gain a uh, language yeah. which gives us parlance, gives us engagement on an international level, and also allows us to be able to operate in the international job market and not only be subject to the national job market. Yeah, okay. This is one of the benefits um, that the study of Arabic um, gives us. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, I, I guess I should mention one thing about uh, a little bit more about Arabic. Um, you know, even though we, we've, we've kind of talked about Arab and Arab nationality, um, you know, it's not, it's not a, it's not an, um, it's not an ethnic group. It's not a, a racial group. Um, I mean, being Arab is similar to being uh, Latino. You know, there's people of different races who speak the language, who are culturally connected. Right? I just got what you meant when you meant those places became Arab. Continue. Mm-hmm. Whoa, that's deeper than deep, bro. Please continue. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a um, racial or ethnic distinction. I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what to call it other than a, a nationality, so to speak. I mean, of course, there's different Arab nations, but uh, social linguistic matrix. Yeah, you know, but I they're mean, yeah, yeah they're con- they're connected through somewhat of a common culture and a common language, um, and you know I, I find it interesting that you know someone like Muhammad is a dean uh, who kind of broke away yeah, from from the uh, yeah professor Muhammad is a dean uh, he, he 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 broke away from the more science temple. And ended up um, doing some studies in uh, a lot of studies in uh, Egypt, and coming back to the U.S. and mentoring a lot of like a lot of. Um, oh, you don't Sunni, mean Sunni Muslims. My professor Muhammad is a dean. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Muhammad is a dean who was. Uh, <laughs> 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 I thought the you one, were level two and two. No, no, no. <laughs> no, the one that uh, started a dean Allahi. Um, Hilarious. Lahi Universal Arabic Association. All right. So he kind of, you know, added on to the concept of uh, Nobu Ali is not right. seeing yourself as a, you know, black, um, 
you know, a black person or an African American, but more so, he he would say a Hamitic Arab. And um, you know, Sham Jabber, mm -hmm. when they did the Janaza for um, for uh, Malcolm X, you know, they were part of this this trajectory, and uh, you know, they really place an emphasis on um, you know learning the Arabic language because you know there's a some people call it a hadith maybe it's a saying maybe it's a popular phrase um, uh, hmm. whoever speaks the language of the Arabs is a is an Arab yeah so, I'm, I'm so you, you can you can hug in to this the spiritual intellectual tradition um, through the Arabic language and really start to reconstruct this nation that that uh, we're a part of so to speak <laughs> so what could we the everyday people start doing if, now now actually I'm 